Organique is 8 years old this year, and since its launch the game has changed in numerous ways. From a party game built by an indie studio to a committed, full-fledged eSport owned by one of the largest corporations in the space. Not only has the scale of the game changed, its direction has too. One of the many ways that this shift has manifested is in the new cars that join the roster. So today, let's look at the evolution of these cars and why things have changed the way that they have. Some people might not be aware of the fact that Rocket League is actually a sequel to another game that came before, Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Powered Battle Cars released in 2008, a name that leaves very little to the imagination. Considering the time period and the small size of Sionics at the time, the game is fairly light on the graphical side. The cars are a bit more cartoonish and simpler, at least compared to its sequel. Definitely playing into the pipe game mood the game was going for. The game did have a grassroots tournament scene, but it was clear that the emphasis on the game was not on that aspect. Rocket League would enter early alpha testing in 2014, with teasers and trailers leading up to the launch, alluding to a greater emphasis on quality and competition. Rocket League's initial car set consisted of improved battle cars from the previous game, that started bridging the gap between the old game and reality. While Rocket League aspired to be more competitive than its previous instalment, it certainly still had a streak of party game in it, launching with four-player split-screen multiplayer which was pretty rare for a game even in 2015, as well as numerous offline options, hinted at Sionix's desire to keep that aspect of the game alive. The first DLC was Supersonic Fury, which debuted the Dominus and the Takumi, which, compared to the original lineup, were clearly much more grounded in reality. We can see here, not even a few weeks after launch, that Sionix were aiming for a much cleaner outlook for this game than its predecessor. By August of 2015, the game had hit player count peaks of over 30,000 on Steam, not even including the countless others who picked up the game for free with PlayStation Plus. The game had seen over 6 million downloads from the PlayStation promotion alone, which ultimately led to the early release server problems, which the game still hasn't recovered from. It's clear that the game would be much larger than the previous. With that success would come more options for developing the game's roster. Most of the early years of the Rocket League cars consisted of movie and game tie-ins, DC and Fast and Furious being two of the most prominent. These were quite loud and banked more on their media appeal rather than the clout of their manufacturers. Things chugged on nicely until the end of 2018, where something changed. The game had seen real cars before this point, but this one came straight from the manufacturer. There was no IP tack-on or media tie-in, this was just a straight up McLaren. While certainly early to the party regarding licensed car manufacturers, it was the vanguard and a sign of what was to come. In mid-2020, Sonics would get acquired by Epic Games of Fortnite fame, and with this acquisition came a considerable boost in available resources. With the launch of Chapter 2 and Free to Play, a chance to clean up the game's presentation a bit more. Rocket League was now much more AAA than indie, and that would show in the vehicles that would follow. The esports scene was growing rapidly at the time too, which gave car manufacturers a very rare in to the gaming space to a viewership in the tens to hundreds of thousands, which, on top of the already increasing scale of the game, made Rocket League a tempting space for all sorts of companies. We would see this manifest by Season 3, with the introduction of Formula 1 and NASCAR sets, followed shortly by Lamborghini. We would also start to see motor companies start to sponsor the professional scene too. As an example, the BMW tie-in with the RLCS 2122 open circuit, as well as the BMW freestyle tournament, which gave spotlight to an otherwise neglected freestyle scene. By the end of 2021, things were starting to shift very quickly in favour of car manufacturers. You had the four sponsored winter split, as well as the accompanying freestyle event. McLaren had dropped their third car and Lamborghini had dropped their second. You might recognise that one. They even had Formula 1 racer Lando Norris driving around Miami in a McLaren doing a Rocket League Q&A. I mean football, I love watching football. And cars, I love cars. If that doesn't say anything about the direction that Rocket League was heading, I don't know what else will. Actually, that's not true, because here comes Season 7 and a tonal shift in the way that Rocket League's Rocket Pass cars are handled from then on. Before this point, the Rocket Pass collection varied a whole bunch. 
Usually they were a little out there and often revolved around science fiction. But by season seven, they had really started to hone in on a more realistic edge to their lineup. And for the first time in season eight, the Rocket Pass would straight up get a real car in the Civic Type R. And then again in the most recent season 10 with the Golf GTI. It was clear then that licensed cars were the future of Rocket League's lineup. The trend from homebrewed pipe cars to licensed, sponsored, meticulous models is undeniable and can be seen from the news site to the YouTube channel. But why did this change happen? What social and commercial factors played a part? Well, it's worth looking at the way that not only Rocket League matured, but the company behind it did too. Sonix came into existence in 2001. Before they really started creating their own games, they were a contract company that helped major studios develop other games, such as Gears of War and XCOM. This, in a sense, would make everything they made in-house a passion project, which is exactly what SARP, made in 2008, was. Being a fun party game, the focus was entirely on creativity and experimentation. And since the budget was understandably tight, there was effectively zero way that anything could remotely tie into reality, even if that was their desire. The 720p trailer and its very time appropriate techno also gives us a little insight into the technological level available to the devs at the time. It's clear that Sonix originated from a time well before gaming as a genre started to mature, and in some way or another the developer had to mature along with it. Moving on to 2015, and it was clear that Sonix had a fair amount more in resources to develop their sequel, Rocket League. Reportedly, the game cost $2 million to develop, and the feedback they learned from Sarp helped them refine their design for a more modern audience. So it was clear that Sonix were perfectly capable of moving with the times and improving their craft as they go. The concept of the game had also been pitched to various larger companies, including Electronic Arts. Thank God that didn't go through. The fact that the company had spent a lot of its history as a contract developer as well, meant that Sonix had larger aspirations and was fine with being subsumed by larger companies, which tend to have a more corporate outlook to game development. This would ultimately be proven true once they were acquired by Epic Games, one of the largest in the space. Epic Games are well known for their very clean presentation style, and that would immediately be reflected in the new chapter of Rocket League, with its sharp style and modern presentation. Whether the heavy corporatization of Sonix and Rocket League was an overall good thing or not, it certainly afforded them the resources to take the game in whatever direction worked best, and bring it in line with other AAA live service games in the space. Obviously, money plays a critical role in why the cars have changed the way that they have. It's much easier to sell people a car that they are already familiar with, and it affords an opportunity to both charge more and cross-promote too. The opportunity to attract companies has expanded exponentially recently, as the game has grown considerably since its initial debut. And these opportunities are far more lucrative than simply making a car in-house. It's also important to acknowledge the early popular franchise tie-ins such as Fast and Furious that laid the groundwork for future endeavours into the corporate space. Their success showed both Sonic and potential sponsors the benefits of getting involved in this way. I believe I mentioned this in my licensed car non-meta episode, but a culturally popular car is much more likely to perform well and attract new players than some random car that got popular for other reasons. You can't advertise an in-house car the same way, and it certainly wouldn't have had the same reach as something with a corporate tie-in. Is this shift in new car style a good thing overall? For the most part, yeah. It's clear that these cars are popular amongst players, considering how many of them make frequent reappearances after their initial launch window. And anything that winds up supporting the eSport we all love is great to see. These things not only increase the popularity of the game, they also bolster the eSports scene and enable companies to do things like host more events, or remake the entire game in a new engine, as an example. The one complaint most often seen is to do with the item pricing. Whether $10 or more for a single car in a game is ever really worth it is up for frequent debate. But in the end, you either buy it or you don't. You can play Rocket League without ever spending a single penny if you like, even if the game tries very hard to make you feel like you're missing out. 